three. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church's Bible study, where we are studying our lectionary text for Sunday, July 30th, 2023, which happens to be the 17th Sunday in Ordinary Time. We have three years of lectionary scriptures, A, B, and C, and we have rolled back around to year A. So we are reading the prescribed texts that we are to choose and to read each Sunday for our our benefit and for our for our spiritual community together. Um, many denominations use these particular texts. Um, those who do use the lectionary, and there are some that sort of veer off of that. And it's a very, very interesting discipline because you can always find something new in the Word of God even when you do them year after year, three years after three years after three years, and I thank God for that. Amen. We're going to start out our, 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 our Bible study with a prayer of, of a petition to give thanks to God who acts wonderfully. This particular Psalm is 105 verses 1 through 11 and then 45b. It's a very long um, Psalm in our lectionary text. It's only um, treating verses 1 through 11. We're talking a lot about Jacob, so this speaks um, a little bit towards the whole beginning of Israel and God's guidance of Israel. God praising the Lord who acted wonderfully towards Israel and the hymn to God's wondrous guidance of Israel, which is both Psalms 135 and 136. And I'll go back to that um, little note once I finish reading this. We have actually two psalms today. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of, the, of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O oh, offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Praise the Lord. So both, as I was saying, Psalms 135 and 136 um, makes the land of Canaan as a symbol of God's generosity and fidelity. The promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and then of course to Moses and the people of Israel. Now, in verse 45, um, uh, the promise is realized differently. Actually, the promise is realized differently in each of the four historical periods selected. From verse 7 onward, the words promise, land, and servant does occur in each of the sections of this particular poem all throughout the verses 45. For our purposes, verses 1 through 6 is an invitation to praise. Verses 7 through 11 follows with a mention of the covenant and the promise of land. That was really all, let me see, that was really all that they gave us for this particular text, but I did want to point out something that I did read. Remember the Lord is our God, his judgments are on all the earth, the commanded thousand, the covenant that he made, the sworn promise. Once again, this, this, always this reiteration that the land is yours and that I promise this land to you. Um, so sing these praises and remember God's promises to all of us. And I'll just move. Are, are there any thoughts on this while I'm sort of looking what, for what I was thinking about? Alrighty then. Oh, here's the, the um, I love this. I wanted us to really remember this verses six through seven, it says, O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord, 
our God, and yet his judgments are all in the earth. They claim a sovereignty. There's a sovereignty of God claimed over all of the earth, even though the God is the God of their, of their nation and of their people. So it's a, it's a wonderful way of looking at how the people of Israel sort of felt, I'm going to use the word, entitled to go forth and to um, have this manifest destiny in all of these lands, in the land of Canaan and over all of these peoples. It's because God's judgments don't just extend to where the people of Israel are. They extend over all of the earth because God is what? The creator. And we are the cho these are the chosen of God's people. So I just wanted to point that out. The next one is Psalm 128. Um, this is the blessing of the man who fears God and is a com companion piece to, 100, to Psalm 127. It's only verses one through six we'll be reading. So happy is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be happy and it shall go well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine. Within your house, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus shall, man, shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. This, I will say that declaring one who fears the Lord, verse one, um, they'll flourish in the family. Verse three, they'll f flourish in national and religious life. Um, I'm sorry, what, I'm sorry, verse one is about fearing the Lord. Um, flourishing and family is verse three. Flourishing in national and religion life, religious life is verse five, verses five through six. These three spheres are closely related. Um, the person who wrote the commentary for this uses um, um, an anachronistic term, um, paterfamilias, which is a, a Romanesque sort of Hellenistic word for male head of the family. For these three spheres are closely related in how they are spoken about in this psalm. Um, the male is the head of the family, the king is the head of the house of Israel, and the Lord functions as the head and the Lord to whom Israel was bound through covenant. Correspondingly, the blessings include fruitful wife and many children, prosperity of Jerusalem and the seat of dynasty, and God's who is the font of every blessing. The psalm is in two parts, verses one through four, a statement in trust, verses five through six, a prayer, a prayer that builds on the statement. You know, very often I look for um, ways of debunking the, the paternalistic way of reading some of our texts. And what I want us to see, because this also extends into the Pauline writings, because when Paul is writing, he's also writing from the context of the very strict Jew, Jewish man who sees the father of the household um, as the head of the house, yes. And we'll talk about the mother of the household when we talk about marriage later on in the next text in Genesis. But the interesting thing here is that I want us to remember that the male head of the household is not supposed to be the one that lords it over it, lords it over and is, is um, you have to do what I say. That's not what this is about. And the king is also not supposed to be this despotic king that is a dictator that says, you have to do what I say, so on and so forth. They're supposed to emulate God's relationship with God's children. If God is the father of paterfamilias or the, or the fraternal patrimonial Lord, how God responds to us and how God treats us with love and with, with honor and with, and with blessings, that is the spirit of everyone who is supposed to be in charge of something. So you have, it's, it's not a duty to be in charge and be over, but it's a responsibility to hold forth and to, to throw out those blessings over your community and your family. Derek, so, I'd like to say something about that. Alluding go ahead. To that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this uh, section, this psalm is chock full of 
visualizations for me. Mm -hmm. It starts with um, that this man will see the fruit of his labor. So he's like tending his uh, garden, mm -hmm. he's tending his sheep. That's his responsibility to do. Because um, if he does not work, he will not eat. But, you know, and then it talks about his wife being fruitful in the house. Doesn't necessarily mean she's going to have a bunch of babies. It just means that everything she puts her hand to will blossom, you know? So it's going back to that Garden of Eden um, model, you know, where they tended the garden and, you know, they were deeply involved in the garden. And even afterwards, when they got kicked out, they still ha had to work the land, you know? And then the picture of the children around the table is not like they're just not there, you know? It's like he's gathering them around the table to talk to them and get to know them. And they're like olive shoots, you know, like tender plants. And he has to he has to take care of these these children, you know? And so, you know, that that's what I'm visualizing when I read this text. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful visualization that you shared with us. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> yeah, I like I like it too. I like it too. Um, happy, um, we can think of as the word fortunate because of, and then you're fortunate because of a quality possessed or a choice made. So because you have these qualities of walking in the ways of the Lord or you choose to walk in the ways of the Lord, you shall be fortunate. Fear. I always like to tackle this word. Happy is everyone who fears the Lord. Fear is, um, in our context, um, especially when I when I work with a lot of young people, I'll never forget being told by a young person saying, that's why I don't like to come to church. Everybody says you got to be afraid of God. And, you know, I've spoken of it in terms of being in awe of God. But hear this as well that when you fear God, fearing God also means to take God seriously and also to reverence him deeply and to honor him greatly. A person must then fear the Lord and walk in his ways. Walking in God's ways is to live in daily obedience to the word of God. And no one will be truly happy while living in disobedience to God. So choosing that pathway and, and making sure that you that um, you have that quality of obedience to God um, and being re and understanding the reverence for God are the places from which this fortunate being fortunate um, arises. Um, and this verse three and four, they both this verse um, both expresses and reinforces the status of the father as the head of the household. Once again, head of household as responsibility um, and what you're supposed to hold and take. Um, and then you bless the nation as well. So peace be upon Israel. This is the second Psalm. I'm not sure which one we're gonna be reading on Sunday. It'll be one or the other. But yeah, that's, that 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 is one of the things I always want. <laughs> I always uh, like, I always be thinking about like um, every time you pray, you always be praying for Israel. So, so every time you you know every time you read a psalm, you say, pray for Israel. You know, like like everything is all about Israel, Israel. So I was like, why is it you cannot say pray for you and pray for Israel? That's that's what they were doing. Um, they were trying to collect the people as one community and understand that you ha you are the chosen people in the covenant with God, and so all of the psalms are written for the people of Israel. Yeah, that's what I yeah. said. Like, so every time I read some, if I read the history, I put my I put my own self. I said, I said, <laughs> peace be upon me. <laughs> well, Paul says we're adopted, so yeah. <laughs> Are there any other thoughts around that particular song? <laughs> Hearing none, let us move to Genesis. And so we know that Jacob has had this vision of the stairway to heaven. Uh, Jacob's ladder, Jacob's stairway, his vision 
um, and God's blessing. And so he's been sent off because he's supposed to go to his father's people and find a wife. So here we are, finally he's made it out there and this is about Jacob's marriage to Laban's daughters. Genesis 29, verses 15 through 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? <laughs> Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel or Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, well, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. <laughs> Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, this is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week, the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. And Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, as a wife. Ooh. So, Jacob asked for Rachel <laughs> as a reward for service instead of paying the usual marriage price. Um, there are many instances in, our, in, the, in the First Testament scriptures, Joshua 15, 16, a daughter being given from one to attack an enemy, 1 Samuel 17, 25, king gives his daughter for, for um, the killing of a man, um, reward to make his family tree in Israel, acquiring the benefits thereof, and of this quote-unquote price can be found in Deuteronomy 22, 29, the man who lay with her, this is an unfortunate circumstance as well. The man who lay with her shall give 50 shekels of silver to the young woman's father, and she shall become his wife because he violated her. Um, he shall not be permitted to divorce her as long as she lives. That's a whole other story. But this was the, this was the, the standard of the time. There was this whole idea of, um, of selling off. But the interesting thing that I found in the second instance of the, of, the, the, of, the, of the one who was given a daughter of the king for the killing of his enemy, the reward was really not even so much to um, have the daughter, but it is to be included into the nation of Israel in this particular case, because the nation of Israel and Judaism goes through the woman of the family. It's a maternal. And so in order for any enemy or anyone outside of the camp to really, besides converting, to really have their children be pure Jewish, um, they get all the benefits of the covenant of God by having children with the Jewish woman, with the daughter of Israel. That's what that particular text is all about. So here we have this troublesome, troublesome text, and he tricks him, Jacob the trickster, um, verses 23 through 25, Jacob the trickster of Genesis 27 is tricked. And interestingly enough, the motif continues all throughout Jacob's story 
from what I hear. Um, the exchange could be made because the bride was brought veiled to the bridegroom. So Genesis 24, 65, um, and said to the servant, who is this man? If you remember with Isaac, who is this man? He, when, um, when Rebecca came to him, um, who is this man over there walking in the field to meet us? She said, the servant said, it is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. Um, so this is a, a part of the tradition of covering yourself and veiling yourself. And you see this in a lot of movies, I'm sure, um, where they bring the bride in on a canopy and her, her face is covered and she's veiled and she's not really seen. Um, and in this particular thing, they're having us understand that she is brought in to the tent after the wedding ceremony. This week thing that they're talking about, the week refers to the, to the week of marriage festivity. So you don't just have a, have a wedding reception, you have a wedding reception for a week. <laughs> and then after that, you sort of move forward in your life. And when he says, um, all, all this time in my, in my growing up, when I was younger, I always thought, oh my gosh, he had to wait another seven years in order to marry Rachel? Apparently, um, he gave him his daughter as a wife immediately, but he still had to work another seven years. So Rachel is given after the week of consummation with the first wife, making her the second wife. Um, and Leah maintains her status as the, older, as the older sister and the matriarch of the household. What were you so going he to married, say? He, mar he married both of them? He married both of them, yes. Lisa, were you going to say something incredulous about this text? <laughs> um, I just, at the beginning, after, after you read it, I was like, this is deep, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I say it because when they talked about firstborn and, you know, the younger one, and I'm a first, I'm the firstborn in my family. And, you know, it's like, we always get the short end of the stick. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. I can I only always, imagine poor Leah, you know, throughout her marriage to this man, you know, it was like I wasn't the one that was wanted, you know, and trying to do her best to just show herself to be worthy of his attention and not getting it, you know, it must have been miserable. Antoinette? I always thought, I'm glad you, and I, I just got in, so I missed mm -hmm. the first part of the discussion, but um, I'm so glad I made it in when I did because I always thought he had to work seven years before he was able to consummate um, the marriage with her. Mm -hmm. um, so when you said that and, and read that verse, I realized, okay, because I thought he had to work seven years to get her. I know, right? <laughs> But you know, I've, I've been in other Bible studies and this is the first one where anyone ever clarified that. Yeah, right after the first week, he was like, okay, now you can have her. That's okay, we get it. I married off, I married off the first one, so you can have her. <laughs> wow. And you know, our, our Psalm did- I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have a question about that. Um, Leah got a week of festivities. Did Rachel? No. Oh, so she got the short end too? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not really, because she got the man. She got it. Well, but she might not have wanted the man. He wanted her, but she might not have wanted the man. I don't know. It's very, it's like a paternity court. It's very complicated. Well, you also remember, um, I, I, I always wonder about the seven years when he was working for Rachel, quote unquote, um, about how they built their relationship in those seven years. You know, I always wonder about, I mean, that's a long time to sort of be getting to know somebody to sort of say, you know, we're going to be married in seven years and um, to get to know one another, maybe get to fall in love, maybe get to just sort of come to an agreement that this is the way that things are going to be. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. We don't have any of the backstory about 
you know, how how even Rachel or Raquel felt about being, you know, duped by her father. <laughs> well, it, it just it, illustrates you know. the patriarchal um, leadership, you know, the patriarchal way of life. It was all about what benefited the men. And I mean, in, in both these cases, I mean, the father-in-law was benefited by, by um, Jacob's uh, labor and Jacob was benefited, or at least he thought he was going to be, hoped he would be, by getting the woman he really wanted. So nobody cared what, what Rachel or um, Leah wanted. Well, there's the assumption of, among all of these texts, especially when, you, when you're in these different ways of studying them, you're, 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 the assumption is that the goal of the woman of a woman is to be married um, and not to be left alone and left of her own accord. Um, so, but it's still, I mean, it, it may be how it actually was, but it's still troublesome in the way that we sort of think about things um, in our modern context. But the, the blessing of this from God's perspective um, is that from what I understand is that Jacob is very interesting as a character, as a pivotal character in the story of Israel, not because he's the father of Israel, but he's a pivotal father figure. Um, he seems to learn from the mistakes <laughs> of the men that have gone before him. You know, he, he treasures the children of both of his, of all of his, all of his children of both Leah and of Rachel, you know, um, even though Jacob was his favorite because he came from Rachel, by the end, um, when he's giving out, you know, the blessings, he, he favors them all equally. Um, he, he blesses them all equally. He seems to learn from the past mistakes um, and learns a little bit more about how to be the father of the household, more like in covenant with his family, the way that God is in covenant with the people. Um, so this being tricked um, teaches him some valuable lessons as he moves forward. You know? Yeah, he was tricked. He tricked his brother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what goes around comes around. The trickster gets tricked, that's it. But what would have happened to Leah if she didn't get married to Jacob? Mm, that's a good question. Um, she would have a less likely chance of getting married because people would have said, oh, your, your younger sister got married before you. What's wrong with you? So maybe the father was trying to make sure that the older daughter got taken care of. In that, in that society, that's exactly what it was. He wanted to make sure that she was taken care of, make sure that, that um, you know, he said, in our, like he said, you know, I, I may have joked about it, but in our country, we don't do things that way. We make sure that the oldest woman is taken care of first um, because we can, you know, she'll, she can always find a brother or marry the husband of her, of her sister or something like that, or, or marry his brother or something like that. We can always acquire, we can always take care of that. Um, but this one I'm worried about. So there's always that as well. There is that beautiful notion of a father saying, well, you know, what I am going to do is I'm going to trick him because, you know, I don't want my, I don't want my other daughter to be left out in the dust as well, because he certainly had no intention of staying there and caring about whatever happened to Leah after her seven years, he was ready to go back to his dad. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, in some societies, if the older sister doesn't get married, the younger sister can. Right. She must be married off first. Was that the case? Would Rachel have been able to marry at all if we hadn't married? You know, it's not specified, but it's it's sort of like this undercurrent of a possibility that that's that that may also be that it's the father that's like we don't do that in our country. You know, she can't get married until her sister gets married. So there's all of these different things that you're bringing up, which are which is beautiful to sort of read this in this way of saying how harsh and how 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 um, difficult this text is, because then it, it sparks us into thinking um, in, in the context of the time period, 
which is which is whole, for me the whole purpose of doing a Bible study is to say, well, really, what was going on in their minds, not what's going on in our minds, what was going on in their minds, and in their culture, and in their community, um, to enable us to be able to step back and to sort of look at this in a in a in a, in a way that we're actually glad that we've moved away from some of these ways of thinking and ways of moving forward. But this is how it how it all started, you know, just, you know, started. I just wanted to say, you know, I don't know how deep you're going to go into this today <laughs> or maybe <laughs> the next session, but I did a quick Google search because I was just curious because I know we hear a lot about Jacob's children by Rachel. We hear a lot about them and we don't hear too much about Leah's children, but when I did that quick Google search and I looked at Leah's kids, I was like, oh my gosh, that's very significant. And I, I don't know if you want me to go any further on that or not. No, go, go ahead. Just give us give us the annotated information. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one of, two of his, ch Leah had seven children for him and of the seven one was Levi and one was Judah and we know that Levi uh, the sons of Levi were the high priest he became the high priest and Judah was established that's where Jesus came from and Judah became the name of the lower kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's where that, and also remember that every every one of these children ended up being a tribe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was the fulfillment of the, the tribes of Israel um, in this household of Jacob's. So every one of them became a tribe in their own right um, that lived in this land mass that they called Israel. You know the northern kingdom the southern kingdom judah um as um in fact in the first century they weren't really known as jewish people they were known as judeans because they came from judea people were very rarely known by their religion but they were more likely known by um the land from which they came i have a different feeling for laban now since you said what you said um it's like he was showing compassion. He wanted to make sure, I never looked at it from that point of view. I mean, yeah, he may have tricked Jacob, but when you mentioned the fact that, yeah, I mean, he wanted to make sure that Leah got provided for. And maybe this was his only way of looking out for his daughter, you know, and caring about her and showing compassion for her welfare. I never looked at him that way before. Mm -hmm. He was doing his fatherly duty. We don't do things like that in our country. I have to take care of my daughter first. So it gives a whole different perspective as to what really took place from another perspective. Especially, he wasn't just conniving. Especially when we think that um, he only waited a week instead of seven years. <laughs> And, and all of this goes back to uh, Psalm 128, mm -hmm. talking about may your, right. children, your wife be fruitful <laughs> in your household and the children like young shoots around the table and you'll see your children's children and through both sets of children, uh, the nation of Israel saw the children's children yeah. of Jacob, you know? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So did did he he ended up still though with um, with Rachel? But what Leah did Leah go with him or no? Yes. So they both went. Mm hmm. Ooh, that must have been real interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and in many ways, now, I do love my sisters though. But anyway, I'm just saying. I don't know what, I'm, like that. what I what I really appreciate about um, the older Testament is that the issue always seems to be between the brothers you know i don't 
remember or recall at this particular moment reading about the enmity between that like Sarah and Hagar were totally different things and they weren't blood sisters of course yeah but that was there there's I don't remember reading of any anger or or animosity between Leah and Rachel that the two sisters were able to stay together for the rest of their lives and that the two sisters were able to be in community with one another um, even after being that they didn't have to separate from one another um, when one was taken, you know, if one was taken from the other. Um, they were able to, to go together and stay together, um, which is a different. And I've always, I've always, always thought um, when I have an opportunity to study even the story of um, the story of Ruth, that there is this bond that is yet to be explored um, by my academic research that I love um, between between the women in the community and how they support one another, knowing that how they are how they are really looked at as property and so on and so forth, but how they take care of one another. If you remember, it is the women in the book of Ruth that took care of Naomi and Ruth when they got back to the land. It is the women who said, go pull up these shoots here. It is the women who came and said, you have had this child now, you've married this man, and they all gathered around you know Naomi and Ruth when they had the when she had the child, and they were the ones. And Boaz is just sort of off in the corner. But it was the and it was Elizabeth, for example, that sort of raised up Mary and gave Mary the idea that her child was just as legitimate in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the temple where she lived, as her own child John. And she saved Mary, in in so many different ways culturally from being shunned and from being, and Mary from her own understanding, after she understood that her, that her Aunt Elizabeth loved her and, and recognized the joy that she was and wasn't going to shame her and discard her, that's when she sings the Magnificat. It is only after the greeting of Elizabeth, when she is, when she is wrapped up by another woman in the community, after possibly being discarded by men, where she finds her entire voice. So I like I like to look for these moments um, in these in the solidarity in the option for solidarity for women in the text as well, and the fact that these two sisters were able to stay together and to raise families together and to be there for one another um, may possibly may just possibly be one way of reading this. <laughs> and you know something to piggyback on that, you know. Um, Years down the line, we see uh, Benjamin was Rachel's last child, I believe. And the implication was that Rachel was gone, you know, had passed away. And um, uh, by that time, Jacob was like desperate that this he not lose this child. But I'm just thinking that if these two sisters were so close all those many years, it, it's possible that Leah, Leah helped to raise Benjamin. Mm -hmm. you know? But well, I, I seem I, to remember, um, I don't know, maybe I'm remembering a different verse or something. Um, I thought in the beginning when Leah started having these children, she kind of like looked upon her sister like, you know, he may love you more, but I'm the one giving him children. It seemed to still be like a one-upmanship to me. It, it's yeah it's difficult in that i think she found her comfort in saying at least i can have the children you know you have all this love and you have the better part of the love but i have the legacy and i have the children um, and that's and, what i saw as some discord and it's and it's hurtful but there's not but there's not the same kind of enmity between jacob and esau you know what i mean that kind of a thing that's what i meant um well and i was just thinking about the genetics of if both of the daughters had children by the by by um jacob i'm just thinking i mean so what would they they be what first cousins first or second over or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they'd be half brothers and sisters and first cousins and, and first, and first cousins, cousins. Mm -hmm. at the same time I'm stuff like that would give you a headache believe me <laughs> i was just sitting here trying but I, but actually, the only only the one daughter had children. The only the one 
one. Well, did both lady, the, yes. both Rachel and Leah yeah. have children? Yeah, but Leah had a whole swell before Rachel could even get pregnant. Okay, so they were half brothers and sisters and and first cousins. Yes, real yeah, close they, gene pool. Real close gene pool. Like the South, <laughs> the yeah, old South. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he and, and it was they were sort of like related anyway because his father sent him to go get marry someone in his hometown that was part of the family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a yeah. That's. A, so I do like the and, and Antoinette. I do love the fact that you know we're talking about you know what was going on in their household and how they ended up and how they spent their time together and the pettiness that would have been between them but the but the overall um i remember when my mom wanted didn't want to move to cape may and i joked at her i said mom what? i said mom i said yes she said i don't want to leave my sisters i said mom they can be a, they're going to be a pain in the butt 10 minutes away they're going to be a pain in the butt 3 hours away so just <laughs> both. you love them anyway right. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's that that kind of relationship that um that i sort of a uh, whole dear uh, right yeah and i think it's uh, some of the um when you look at some of the information that's out on some of the families and uh you know some of the the marriages and say like the nigerian cultures and they're you know they have more than one wife and you do see that sort of similar sort of setup that the first wife is the one that kind of like is the boss to the other wives and they you know she can either nurture them or not i guess but um not too different in that in that sense i don't know that they're siblings but um but in the same sense of that first one has the top rank and those that come after are all sort of kind of under that first wife's tutelage yeah and apparently this love relationship that he had with with rebecca you know, somebody had to take care of the household. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it it's could have also evolved that um, because, you know, Rachel was very, very new as a mother when she had her first child and Leah was an old hand. She may have stepped in to really take the part of like their mother and showing her, you know, this is a new baby. This is what you do. This is how you handle this. Um, I know when my mom and, um, you know, her older sisters had come to New York before she had. Um, and so by the time um, she married my dad and had me, her mother was still in Virginia. It was her older sister, you know, that really kind of became like my grandmother in a way. She was a lot older than my mother anyway. And um, she was the one that went with my dad and my mom to the hospital whereas my grandmother was in Virginia. So she played a role as her older sister to her baby sister as nurturer and teacher, you know, and that may have been the, the relationship that developed between, uh, you know, Leah and Rachel. There was no, it, might not have been any more empathy between them. I think, that there's, I think that there's the opportunity for all of this. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, I think it just, it's, I think it just sort of fleshes it out and humanizes these women in the text that we don't read that much about a little mm -hmm. bit more. Because I remember your um, mom's sisters and I always sort of kind of remember Derek, that, and I'm not sure if it was your Aunt Harriet that was the oldest. Which, who's Aunt, the oldest? Aunt Kitty, Aunt Kitty was the oldest. Okay, was Aunt ha the Harriet was the one that seemed to be the one over and looking and all the you know, others. You know, you know what was really interesting, uh, and I'll tell you all this this bit of family family history, is that um, Auntie, Aunt Harriet, um, wasn't really over there, but I named her Auntie so that she would take on that role of Aunt Dot. But when my grandmother died on her hospital bed when mom was 17, um, she pulled my mom in and said, Priscilla, I need you to be the one to look after your sisters. And she she actually listed out all of her worries about all of the, all of the, all of the five sisters and says, you're the one who has the sense who needs to look out for them. Mm. So wow. it was really, it was really my mom. Mm. At yeah, but was it real? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's why, that's another reason why she didn't want to leave because she had made that promise to her mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I saw all of them and they all were very close, but, it, but, you know, it just seemed to me 
that um, Harriet, who was the quieter, she's kind of in the middle of, of things, and but not not a big talker necessarily. Just um, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just interesting to watch all the sisters, and there was there was a few of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, a few of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just want to amend my statement. <laughs> amend. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> because um, what you said is is true. Leah had a bunch of kids before Rachel could have children, but some of those children weren't actually hers. Um, when we look at uh, Genesis, where it talks about Leah going into uh, becoming the wife of Jacob, it mentions that Zilpha her handmaiden was given to her. And he actually had children from this handmaiden as well. So the children of Leah, uh, Levi, specifically Levi and um, Judah, were Leah's children, biological children. But there were about three or four children who were actually uh, Zilpha's children. And then, after all of that, um, Jacob had Joseph from Rachel, and then Benjamin, and she, uh, Rachel passed away during childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. That's how it is. So there's three mm. different women with and in, in the in the history in the history of of this text, it's important to understand that when the father said when it says in the text that the father gave Zilpa um, as a handmaid to to Leah, that basically everything that belonged to Zilpa really belonged to Leah, including her children. Mm-hmm. And and I think um, yeah. Zilpa had the only daughter. Mm-hmm. She did. So everybody else was 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 a ma- male, so there would be no problem with uh, uh, you know genetic anomal- anomalies and all of that craziness going on because they'd have to go outside to find wives. Mm-hmm. Interesting stuff, isn't it, y'all? Yeah. 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 Andrea, before you leave, is there anything you'd like to say, or have you left already? <laughs> She said she had to leave at seven. She has other another thing to prepare for. Wow. People think the Bible is boring. Come on now, right? I told you. <laughs> told you. I told you. It may be the same text every three years. But there's always something well, new that to, comes up. They need to be studying with us. We can give them the annotated. <laughs> the annotated version. Right, DT? There you go. That's it. So very good. Very good. I am I am glad that I was I'm so I was so excited to go through this text with you all. <laughs> I knew it would not be a quiet a quiet evening with this. So this is one of uh, yeah. Well I think it's so important to really delve deep into the role of women and that's you know, we ju- you just don't get that same sort of look when you're doing a snapshot of it on a Sunday service. You just don't get that. You know, mm-hmm. so I just, you know, I'm very thankful and that everybody's on and that, you know, you're here to teach us. And don't and and don't don't count it lightly that you are born into the the into the Hebrew culture through the mother is what makes you Jewish. Yes. So it's really important that, that as we go through these texts, that when we think about women, which is why in the in the in the genealogy of of Jesus um, in the book of Matthew, um, it's important to name some of these these women who are thought of to be, you know, throwaway women in the Bible, mm. you know, as descendants of uh, as mothers of Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's really powerful when you sort of look at right. that and right. that context when you think that. You know that that um, that Ruth was was the grandmother to David, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and all of that just sort of stems from all of this that we're talking about. And it's just so it's really important, I think, to to 
and to to add to your point, I think it's important that we not just gloss over it. No. Because they are they are the they are the through line seam mm-hmm. of this history mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and is. of this faith tradition that we in which we find ourselves. And and I think it I think um the revisitation as you said in the beginning of the study is that every three years it cycles, but every three but it there's there I don't think you ever get to the end of what is there. Right. It's like um, you know, we Google tonight, we we annotated and then we amended and <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but I think, you know, that's that's the beauty and the gift and so that revisitation, even if you did it three years from now, you're still going to find something else that just adds to the richness of the understanding of it. Because you, you know, because we tend to take the scripture literally, but there's so much history there, and so much deep thinking that changes the complexion of what you're reading. I was in a Bible study or listening to a preacher years ago, and. Uh, he or she said, stated that when you read something in the Bible, if it even, especially if it seems like unrelated, and why is it stuck there? There's a reason why it's there. And so, um, when I was like looking over these names again, I said, that's why they put in parentheses, you know, Zilpha was given to Leah, you know, mm-hmm. right? Because you had to. You had to, um, I mean, for all ancient readers of this script, they would understand the connection. Yeah, we yeah. have to grasp for it. For us, it's foreshadowing. Yeah, we don't, we don't get that at all. Right. That's like, you know, right. that's like illegal these days. You know. Yes. 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 And to draw the connection, as um, Reverend Doctor D. Rock did, to how we connect to the lineage because so very often as women especially in our in in the baptist um you know we're still in that space of the of of women taking that back seat and we have to re- we we need that constant affirmation that we are there and so you know i really appreciate always that you know that uh he stops and, and points out the strength of women and that we're not a minor role we're a major role and, and also going back to um, the first psalm that you read, and it talks about Canaan, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, growing up, I had this attitude was like, well, what was God doing? You know, these people had a right to be where they were because, you know, they were there first and da 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 and all of this. But in the, in the long-range view of it, God was making way for the adoption of the whole world. Mm-hmm. And when you, and it, it, it's so funny that you mentioned that, uh, Lisa, because if you go back to the Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel, mm-hmm. um, this is something that floored me in one of our legendary studies, is that when you go back to the Tower of Babel, when you find out all of the different um, lands and the languages and the places to which people went, you start to see them all throughout the rest of the history. And it's the same group of people that God was in talking to um, that God was sort of like, well, you're not going to build a tower, but that's all of the same land that those people went to is the same land that God promises Abraham. So there's like this promise and then all these, they forget about it and all these other people sort of like build up and say, oh, well, we're in Canaan and we're over here, but God's like, I'm going to give you this land that you had before that I'm going to give it, give it all back to y'all. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting way of looking at this particular text, but this is one of the things I also do want to want to reiterate what I do want to state. I don't want to reiterate it. I want to state it is that the ideas that we spoke of tonight and the ideas that we fleshed out tonight and many of the different suppositions and the many of the different thoughts that we've had, I want you to realize that they're not just things that we're coming up with and I'm letting us go off into these these wild imaginations. These are all um, textual criticisms and studies of of ideas and thoughts that have been that have been laid out for centuries around these texts. 
So I don't want you to think that we're sort of making it up as we go along. I'm, I'm when I'm bring when I'm bringing this stuff up, I'm bringing it up because there there have been writers and and um, academic academicians who have really delved into this and delved into the context and delved into the to the role of women in this. And these are some of the thoughts that they've been having as well. They naturally rise up from us. So I want, mm. wanted to let you know that you'll hear me when I say, but I think we're crossing over here and we're crossing over this and that we ought to be careful around this. But um, that's not the case um, tonight, as you've heard. So when and, I don't do that. Know, when you talked about women having voices, you know, like Mary with the Magnificat, you know, and all it, there's so many other examples in scripture, Old Testament and New, where women had a voice. And then you see in 2023, Southern Baptists are kicking, you know, congregations out because they have a female pastor, you know, mm -hmm. and we're right back. <laughs> we're right back at square one, you know, it's like, do are women supposed to speak? Well, you prophesy, know, talk, the problem, the, the real issue for me in terms of all of that is that when when people are threatened because of an authority that they want to have, all of a sudden these rules and regulations come out. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're, Baptist churches are congregationalists. If you're kicking somebody out of your conference, it doesn't mean that you're not Baptist. And it doesn't mean that, and that's what's happening. Women will go and they'll start their own churches and they'll get their own followings and they will far out, they will far eclipse they will eclipse these denominations that are trying to stay in the 1800s and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, I see it. And I've seen it. And they're repeating, they're repeating actually what happened from the writings of Paul and people who were writing in Paul's names. You know, Paul, we are all, there's no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no slave, there's no man, there's no woman. But then we get to this generation afterwards when it's like, well, tell the women to be quiet in the church. And we like to say, well, this is what Paul said. Paul was speaking, I mean, the writers of those texts that people that we think were written by Paul that weren't written by Paul were really dealing with the social context issue of the time. All these women's husbands who were Gentiles, who were who, many of the women who were Gentiles, who were who had money because their husbands were off for war and so on and so forth. They were building churches. They were feeding people. They were running the communities. And men were saying, you know, we got to find a way to shut them up. It's in the same text that women are supposed to be silent, that you say that a woman who is widowed should not get married until she's 60 again. Right. And this is, this is a way of once we sort of get through the first few years of Paul and the first few years of, of Christ's disciples, then we start to, trip, we, those are ideas about how we, can, how we can open this up for everyone. And then generations, which is what's happening now, we do, we repeat this, then generations later, what ends up happening is, is well, how do we tell people that they can't be in here? What are the parameters that we get to set up that keep people out? And it's and it it goes like that generation after generation. The whole thing. What did the Peter and those guys do? Let everyone come. Bring everything that you have. We will feed one another. We will take care of one another. How did that change? Hmm. How did the church change? Because we know because no one knew the time nor the hour when Christ was coming. And they said, well, we got to start making some decisions about who's in and who's out. It's the same thing in the epistles of John 1, 2, 3. And all of those other, and it's the same thing in all of those epistles that are written in the name of these, these other folks that are the same names of our gospel writers and, and the same name of Paul, but it's, they're not their letters and they're not their words. Hmm. So it's, 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 it's difficult, but it's the human condition. Once we figure out that we got something good, we say, well, how do we keep people out? <laughs> and how do we keep control over it? Mm -hmm. And it's what usually happens. So. But now we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying, well, we think we're trying to open it and we're trying to figure out how to bring people in. 
but we still have that confusing that confusing notion of in order to be in you have to do yes. this this and this yes we do yes we do <laughs> <laughs> yes we do so and, like, and, we, it, and we, it goes and it goes back to the yes, we do. gospel lessons where jesus was sitting with tax collectors and mm -hmm. you know all kinds of sinners and they were you know the pharisees and you know the the higher echelon of the temple we're talking about him you know and he pointed out that when his cousin john came fasting and you know preaching and they said he had a, he had a demon because he was not eating and now he's eating and he's got a demon you know it's 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 that it, people humans are never satisfied there's always got to be something wrong you know something not right and when I see, and this is not just, I'm not just pointing to Orthodox Jews, you know, I'm pointing to orthodoxy, quote unquote, in Christian life. That, like you said, Derek, is like, these people are in and these people are out because they're not doing what we want them to do. And yet Jesus said to outreach to everybody, Bring them all in. Yes, he did. You know? Yes, he uh, did. In the parables, he was like, the, the wedding feast. Go and put robes on, you know, the, the, the street trash and bring them in. Yeah. That's what he, he said. And, uh, and our denominations are set up, and, well, religious structures are set up in very many ways. Um, mm -hmm. I picked up all my church history books from my Columbia office the other day. I was looking through them. Very often the, the the denominations and churches are set up to say, okay, well, we're thinking this way differently. And in order for you to be a part of us, you yep. have to be just like us. You have to mm -hmm. attend. We have to see how many times. They're not really a member. How many times? Was it online? Was it in person? Was it at all? You know? <laughs> no. Were you, were you back? Were you baptized by immersion or baptized uh, by sprinkling? And when were you baptized? You? Were they certified? Were, were you 14, oh, no. 15, or 50? Yeah. You know, it's like ridiculous. It really is. It's very annoying. I, I have people, you know, uh, and I, like I have, uh, my family is multi-denominational. Okay, even my parents, neither one of them were in the same denomination and my brother and I were raised in a third. So it's like, um, I go to different denomination of ch churches and I've had people question me about my baptism. And I said, well, I was baptized in the Presbyterian church at the age of 13. Were you immersed or were you sprinkled? I said, I was you go. Oh my God! I it's like, you get to come it's to this just, church and get yeah. dunked because you're yeah. not your baptism yeah. isn't right. Well, I, I, yeah. I, I love what Yvonne Wright Gary said at one point in time when she was attending the Presbyterian Church, and they said, "How can you join that church? Don't you aren't you a member of Macedonian?" She says, "Well, how did you? How can you be a, a Presbyterian?" She says, "I'm a Christian that worships at a Presbyterian church." Amen. There you go. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So that's, hey, wait, that's hey, wait, that. Derek. And mm -hmm. now she's at she's Assembly of God. She's, now she's at Assembly of God. <laughs> she started with us in Macedonia with yeah, you yeah. the Presbyterian. But guess what? She's still a great woman of faith. I'll tell you, say that. That's, and that's I don't care where you see her, she's still a great woman of faith. I that's what I can say, definitely about Yvonne. No doubt about that. And you're right, she has, but when you when you're in her presence, you feel love. So let's move on to our Roman mm -hmm. state, and then we'll go to our gospel because I have a, a have bunch of here. I know, right? <laughs> Romans 8, 26 through 39 is continuing about our groaning inwardly. And verse 23 is because the, the Spirit is at work in our prayers, interceding for the saints. Um, dramatic language used in chapter 9 as well. But likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints.
according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ooh, that's an amen. 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 All right now. Now that had to be Paul. That's Paul. <laughs> that's Paul. That's definitely that had Paul. To be Paul. Now that rings Paul, right? That's Paul. Mm -hmm. That's genuine Paul. That's 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 the true Paul. That's right. That's right. That's the radical Paul. Um verses twenty-eight through thirty-eight through thirty. Alternate translations um that says um for all things were together is God makes all things work together for good, or in all things, God works for good. It's all good stuff and good. Um, but those, rep those translations represent the readings in the earliest manuscripts. Paul means that not that all circumstances of this life are good for us. The lament in 836 is actually genuine. You know, the, um, for your sake, we are being killed. Um, it is genuine, but amid all these things, God's purpose prevails. That's, that's what I wish would lead the headlines. Yes, Israel is, is taking away all of the power of its court to check its, its parliament. But amid all this craziness, God's purpose will prevail. Philippians 3.21, conformed to the image of his son, it says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. So Christ is the firstborn for us. Remember God, Abba, and our adoption that we talk about, and we are adopted into it. Christ is the firstborn, and we are, we are aligned with Christ in that, conformed to that image, um, so that he may be firstborn. Uh, the fact that Christ is raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have died, Christ is firstborn for us. Those whom he has predestined, he also called preeminently Israel. You know, Paul is talking about Israel to these Romans, but also those whom he called are the children of promise, including those Gentiles. So there are the predestined that are in the covenant and then those who God continues to call us. Previous assurances in verse 31 through 39 of God's love um, from 511, from chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, are reaffirmed. Despite all present adversities, again, God will prevail. Um, who is to condemn? The heavenly Christ intercedes for us 
and the spirit intercedes for this for the saints i love that whole idea that the spirit intercedes um, for us and hears our prayers and brings them to god as well um, hardships that are going on verses 35 through 36 let me just double check this one uh, yes we already did that one 36 um who will separate us from the from the love of god love of christ these hardships are real y'all they're hardship or sword sword or very real affliction uh, um, afflictions as israel experiences testified once again it takes me back to that thought that paul is remembering the history of e of israel as people in diaspora and people of oppressed and he's likening that experience metaphorically also to the people who are gentiles who are in the same situation under the romans they've been plucked from their homes they've been told they must worship another god they must they're told they got to eat this told they have to drink this and this persecution is at the cause of death so it's very real all this stuff is being very real so hardship distress persecution famine nakedness peril or sword it's all going on and then this for i love this for your sake we are being killed all day long we are accounted for as sheep to be slaughtered it's a quote from psalm 44 22. um because you are because of you we are being killed all day long and accounted as sheep for the slaughter point being i want my point to be here to you all killed quote unquote translates as to kill to die to be put to death it is the present indicating um it is the present verb indicating continual action this happens all the time for your sake that we are being killed all the time all this is happening and it indicates to these people that you are in constant danger of being put to death in the greek treatment that paul is speaking this psalm text because it was the the greek the greek the roman septuagint of 70 scholars that translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek changed some things. And the Greek text treatment of the Septuagint translation of the Psalm text, Paul brings it out with greater urgency and, and named depression for where they are right here and right now. So he, 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 he takes that Psalm verse that says, because of you, we are being killed all day long and account of the sheep for slaughter. And he's speaking to this group right here right now and saying we are continually going through this this is happening to us all the time and we are always in danger of being death but in all of things we are more than conquerors because even with all that nothing can separate us from the love of god and christ and jesus our lord another way that i love to always try and say that christ didn't just conquer death in the very real world he conquered the power of the cross because folks weren't afraid to die. Roman used that as a terror tactic so that you would be hanging on the side of the road and you would be afraid that you didn't want to do anything because you didn't want to die that horrific death. Jesus said, well, you know what? So what? We're going to come back from this. So nobody was afraid of that power of, of, of terrorism anymore. So nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have six. I, I would like. I would like to talk about verse twenty-nine. Okay, go ahead. Um, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. Family. I think that refers to us, to everybody, because uh, going back to one of the psalms that we just read from the lectionary i think it was 139 that talks about how god knew us before we were born before we were conceived in our mother's wombs you know and this and this is also a reference to the philippians text 3 321 he says he will transform the body of our humiliation so that it may be conformed to the body of his glory the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. 
It does. Thank you for that, Lisa. He knew me. Search me. You ready for these bunch of parables? <laughs> <laughs> this one, um, this whole gospel has so many of the parables in it. So um, these are among the parables that are in verses 24 through 33. Let's just hear these. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in his branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. And then there's our, our, our three other ones that we have here. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good in baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of, who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. That is a sane net that they're talking about casting out that net. So let's just go through these. Mustard seed, the species can't be determined. However, mustard seed was popularly regarded as the smallest of seeds planted by farmers. This bush that they're talking about growing into a tree is actually a shrub that grows to a height of about 10 feet or three meters so that the birds of the air can come and nest in its branches. Interestingly enough, this is one of those um, parables that's like a, a, a riddle in a way, because it's sort of like the kingdom of heaven is like something that you would never expect. You would never expect the birds of the air to nest in a shrub, even if it is 10 feet. But Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is going to be, it's going to be enough out of the least for everyone. This, this measure of yeast uh, let's see, this yeast that they're talking about is not really, not yeast, but leaven, that, that remnant of the fermented dough that's used as a starter for raising a new batch of dough, like Irish soda bread or sourdough. Sourdough, yeah. You know, it never starts from scratch. You have to have a starter batch, batch of it. The kingdom of heaven is like that, that little small bit that you mix in with three other measures, and then it all gets leavened so that you can have a brand new batch of dough. Um, and the three measures equals um, a woman takes in and mixed it in and you actually get um, two thirds of a bushel out of it 21 liters I looked up those measurements for y'all <laughs> <laughs> 43 through 50 44 through 53 a field in the absence of banks valuables were often hidden um, for safekeeping Matthew 25, 25 speaks about that. But that's what that's why it's like the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Valuables are often hidden for safekeeping. Someone found and hid. Then we go off and sell all that we have and buy that particular field. So people say, why are you buying that rotten piece of property? Because <laughs> I already buried my treasure in it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> people say, why are you, why are you giving up all that stuff to be a Christian? Because I already buried my treasure in the kingdom of heaven. So I'm good. <laughs> A merchant in terms of pearls, it's the same kinds of thing. Um, this net, this net that the, the the rounded net that you would throw out, that you would encircle, and then the fish would come in and you'd pull up a full net. It's a beautiful image that you see. Um, but this is all what the kingdom of heaven is like. And the kingdom of heaven is a misnomer for the Greek. It's really called the Basileia of God, the Basileia of heaven. Um, that's what the word is, the Basileia. And the Basileia is, is the community into which they're, they're, in which we all belong and there is enough and that it is God's community. Um, that this is what we're talking about, this, this whole thing about that. And the final parable in, the, in there, um, the scribe, Okay, uh, have you understood all this? Unlike uh, Mark 4, 13 and 33 through 34, here are the disciples, because you remember in Mark, the disciples never get anything. They never understand anything. Here, they, they get it. And they That's confirm the understanding. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> they never get it. I thought they were just saying yes. <laughs> you, know, you know how you do, you know, like when your parents says, did you, did you understand what I just said? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom, this is important to understand. Scribe is perhaps a self-portrait of the gospel's author or an indication of early Christ follower scribes not the temple scribes the scribes that have been trained for the kingdom of heaven not like those who have been trained for the temple right mm. and they they've been trained like the master of a household his treasure the storeroom from which he draws the understanding of jesus ministry the new who brings out the understanding of jesus ministry what is new which is jesus ministry and what is old and separates it out the Jewish scriptures, both oral and um, oral and written. So all this stuff again, I always point out is Jesus ministries are the treasure that is new, um, and that is all brought out for people. Um, yeah. So I know so we've gone over our time today. Let's talk. Go ahead. Go ahead. So is the Torah then considered old? Yes. Yes, the old law and the way that it's being interpreted, especially in the Pharisees, remember had the, they had the oral Torah, so they were going around telling people about this is what it really means. And Jesus is saying, I have a new way for you. I have a new way for you to understand these commandments. I have a new way for you to understand how they are intertwined with one another. Um, when he said um, to, the, to the Pharisee or the scribe, one of the two, he said, um, which is the most important commandment? Love God with all your heart and all your mind. The man, the person asked Jesus. And he said, but, but the second is also like it. Love your neighbor as yourself and love God. And he's like, oh, you're really right about that. But these are two separate things that Jesus is saying. They're intertwined. They're not separate from one another. So that's a new understanding of, of the ministry of Jesus, as opposed to how people were reading the old Torah as one or the other, or one on top of the other, so on and so forth like that. Um, birds. Uh, birds, Ezekiel talks about, I will plant it that they, were, um, that they may produce boughs and bear fruit, become noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. The, the, the whole idea of everything coming together under God's and the way that God wants us all to be is often used as an image of all of these birds coming together and finding a place to be at home. And Daniel said, upon my bed, I wanted to get to this one. This is what I saw. There was a tree at the center of the earth. Sounds like revelation, right? And its height was great. The tree grew great and strong. Its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it provided food for all. The animals of the field found shade under it. The birds of the air nested in its branches, and from it, all living beings were fed. If you remember, Daniel is an apocalyptic text, 
and so is the book of Revelation. They're companion pieces, actually. When you read Daniel and read the book of Revelation, you'll be amazed at how similar they are. An apocalypse is the uncovering. We are often told that it's, when you look at Merriam-Webster dictionary, it's the end of the world, it's about the final destruction. In Greek, the word apocalyp apocalypsos and apocalypse is really about the uncovering of God's final will. So the uncovering of God's final will is like this tree. So my friends, we have gone through a lot of stuff today. We have rescued the, the lineage of women in the text. <laughs> We have talked about yes. our, our interpretations and our freedom to understand that, you know, our stuff is rooted in, in fact and in Holy Spirit. We have heard these parables and yes, we can say we've understood. And we can also say with Paul, oh, thank be, thanks be to God. Yes. What will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? I've been really big on these affirmations that I've been finding in scriptures. Wouldn't this be a good one for us to start saying to ourselves every morning during this troubling time in which we find ourselves? If we say, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Put it on your mirror. Amen. Yes. yes. Amen. We'll do. We'll yes. do. Amen. And go and be blessed. Amen. <laughs> all righty. Everybody have a thank you. Thanks, Thanks, so, uh, Thanks. Have a good night.